स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Welcome to this course on complex analysis. This is a first course on complex analysis. The prerequisites that will be needed for this course would be a sound understanding of basic linear algebra and basic real analysis. If you have seen some abstract algebra that will certainly help. But other than the first lecture the rest of the course will not use much material or much knowledge from abstract algebra. Regarding the textbooks so let me note down uh, a few books so i should warn that we don't have a prescribed textbook for this course however most of the material that can be uh, that will be covered in this course can be found in almost all the classical books written in complex analysis however i would like to refer the following books for this course the first one being complex analysis by stein and shakarchi stein and shakarchi the second is title functions of one complex variable there are two parts in this book so uh, i'll be the the material that we will cover in this course will be found in the first part and it's by john b conway of course there are many 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 beautiful books written in this subject maybe i should give a few other references so there is this is old classic it's called complex analysis by Lars Alfors There's also complex analysis by Theodore Gamlin There's also this fantastic book real and complex analysis with a slightly different approach by walter rudin of course there are many many more books let me not write down all of them and i would also suggest that you refer to these other references in maybe a second or a third reading okay that's about textbooks there will be weekly assignments in this course and you are very strongly encouraged to work on these problems on the, on your own uh, should spend some time sitting and thinking about these problems that will give you much better clarity on the subject material that will be covered more or less everything to introduce the course to you so let's now begin the study of the subject in a course in real analysis you would have started by studying uh, rational numbers you would have seen that rational numbers have certain deficiencies for example if you look at the cauchy sequence or some cauchy sequences in rational numbers they do not converge and real numbers were constructed precisely to address this particular problem real numbers were uh, the complete field which contained rational numbers and it was unique up to isomorphism field isomorphisms and we developed you would have developed uh, and studied an entire rich and beautiful theory of real analysis on this on this field of real numbers but then from an algebraic point of view real numbers also have certain drawbacks so there are polynomials for example which do not have roots in the real numbers for example x square plus 1 is a polynomial which does not have root a root in the field of real numbers complex numbers was historically constructed in order to address this particular problem 
So let's start this course by recalling what a field is. So a field F is a set with two operations. Let's call these operations addition, which I'll denote by plus and multiplication, which is being denoted by cross, which satisfy the Pullen properties. These operat operations satisfy a set of properties. What are they? First one is mutability. If you take two elements, x comma y in f, x plus y is always equal to y plus x. The order in which we take the sum doesn't matter, and x times y is equal to y times x. The order in which you multiply also does not matter, they are commutative. The second one is associativity. So, for x, y, z in f, x plus y, if you add them first and then add it to z, this is going to be equal to x plus the sum of y and z. So which two elements you add first should not affect the final result. Similarly, x times y times z is equal to x times y times z. Associativity. Associativity is a property which holds for addition and multiplication. The third property is the third property is existence of additive and multiplicative identities. Additive and multiplicative identities. There exists an element, let me call it 0, let me denote it by 0 in f such that x plus 0 is equal to x for all x in f. This is the additive identity in f. There exists an element 1 in f such that x times 1 is equal to x for all x in f. So basically, there are two very special elements in the field f. What next? Fourth property is distributivity. The addition and the multiplication operations they interact with each other. So for x, y, z in f, x times y plus z is always equal to x, y plus x, z. And finally, existence of inverses. So for x in capital F, there exists y in capital F such that x plus y gives you the additive inverse, uh, additive identity and, and for x in f minus 0, there exists a z in f such that x times z is equal to the multiplicative identity. So, the multiplicative inverse is existent, is existing only for non-zero elements in the field. So, this is the 
set of all properties which needs to be satisfied by the two operations for our given set to be a field. So that is the definition of a field and we are familiar with the field of real numbers. The set R is a field of is a field with the usual addition and multiplication operation. But the algebraic structure of uh, the field of real numbers have certain drawbacks. So, let me just note that down. However, the algebraic structure of R has certain deficiencies or drawbacks. For example, all polynomials need not have roots in the field of real numbers. So, for example, uh, for every x in R, x square is positive and hence x square plus 1 does not have this polynomial does not have a root in R. And the complex numbers, the field of complex numbers is created or is constructed in order to address this particular drawback. of addressing roots of polynomials. The field of complex numbers is constructed to address this drawback. Let me just give start with a definition for a field of complex numbers. So, definition. A field of complex numbers C. This is a set, is a field, it is not just a set, it is a field which contains R as a subfield which contains R as a subfield and a root I to the polynomial x square plus 1. The characterization is not over. Furthermore, this is not enough to speak about a field of complex numbers. We need something more. Furthermore, the field of complex numbers is the smallest such field which contains r and i. Rephrasing it, there does not exist. a proper subfield of C containing R and I. When put differently, this says that C is generated by R and I or if you have C C prime a subfield of C which contains R and I and C prime should necessarily be equal to C. So, this is the, so let me just show you the definition of a field of complex numbers. So, yeah, let me repeat the definition for you. A field of complex numbers is a field which contains R as a subfield and also it has a solution to the, a root to the polynomial x square plus 1 and it is the smallest such field which contains both R and I. This is going to be our definition of a field of complex numbers. However, this definition poses immediately poses many questions. The first question would be why would there exist such a field of complex numbers? And uh, let us say we did manage to prove that there exists such a field of complex numbers. The second question would be what if 
through another method we get hold of another field of complex numbers can we talk about any uniqueness on which of these two fields do we study analysis on so both these answers can be both these uh, questions can be answered satisfactorily so yeah this definition let me note what i just said poses the following questions Well, the first one being, does there exist such a field of complex numbers? We might want it, but what is the guarantee that it exists? And the second one is, can we say anything about the uniqueness? So the rest of the lecture will be attempting to answer these two questions. Let's begin by addressing the existence. So in order to address the existence of such a field of complex numbers, we will be using some notions from abstract algebra, more precisely from ring theory. So if you have not seen a course on abstract algebra, uh, there is no problem. You may skip the remaining part of the lectures, you can assume the existence and the uniqueness of such a field of complex numbers, move over to the next lecture. From the next lecture onwards, there will be more focus on the analysis on such a field of complex numbers. So, we will not be needing too much of uh, background in abstract algebra. However, in this lecture, we will be assuming some amount of uh, knowledge in ring theory. All right. So, let R of x be the collection of all polynomials, formal polynomials over R, the field of real numbers. So, formal polynomials, there is no need to make the distinction here, but nevertheless, let me make the right definitions. So, these are, so a formal polynomial is an expression of the type a0 plus a1x plus ad x to the power d, where a i are real numbers and d is a non-negative integer and d is a non-negative integer. Because this is a space which you would have seen many times and you will be very familiar with but nevertheless let me give a formal definition to make everything complete. So, we will be familiar with uh, the addition of polynomials, multiplication of polynomials. Let me not give all those things as definitions again. Let me just note that with the usual addition and multiplication of polynomials, R of x is a commutative ring with identity. With identity. So, if uh, you have not seen abstract algebra before, a commutative ring is a set with two operations with almost all these properties satisfied except the last one. But anyway, so let me not focus too much on all those things. So, R of x will turn out to be a commutative ring with identity. What are the, uh, okay, the, the operations being, what are the uh, identities here? The 0 polynomial is the 
additive identity and the constant polynomial one will be the additive uh, multiplicative identity here. Okay. The first thing to note is that R of x is a commutative ring which is not a field. Not all elements can be inverted. In fact, any non constant polynomial is not a unit, cannot be inverted. There does not exist a multiplicative inverse for any non constant polynomial in R of x. Why is that the case? Because we have a notion of the degree of a polynomial, the d that appeared and if you look at the product of two polynomials, the degree adds up. So, if you uh, want an inverse, we would for a polynomial p, there should exist a q such that p of x times q of x is the constant polynomial 1. The constant polynomial 1 has degree 0. However, if p has degree greater than 0, then degree of p x times q of q x will always be greater than or equal to 1 and hence it cannot, cannot ever be uh, a constant polynomial. So, let me just uh, note that down. Since the degree of the product of two polynomials is equal to the sum of the degree of the polynomials and the degree is always a non-negative number and therefore non-constant polynomials can never have an inverse degree of the two polynomials. All right, so this is a commutative ring which is not a field. Therefore, we can talk about ideals. So, let us take the polynomial we are interested in. After all, what, what, why are, why are we doing all these things? We are trying to get hold of a root for x square plus 1. So, let us take the polynomial x square plus 1. Since x square plus 1, this is a non-constant polynomial is not invertible. The ideal generated by x square plus 1 will not be the entire ring. The ideal generated by x square plus 1 is a non trivial ideal. Recall that an ideal is a subset which is closed under addition, and if a is an element in the ideal for any element b in the ring a times b will be in the ideal and the ideals are the right objects with which we take quotients in a ring. So, what will happen if we take the quotient of r of x by the ideal generated by x square plus 1? We will be killing x square plus 1 that will be the right place to look for a root of x square plus 1. So, let us define C to be the quotient of R of x by this ideal x square plus 1. What are the objects here? The objects here will be cosets of the ideal x square plus 1. And what will be the operations that addition and multiplication we will have here? Let me write the operations down. So, for the cosets for P of x plus x square plus 1 in C and q of x plus x square plus 1 in C. So, when are these two uh, elements equal? Let me start from there. p of x plus x square plus 1 is equal, the coset representatives are equal if p of x minus q of x belongs to the ideal x square plus 1. This manifests in telling that i e, so this is actually if and only if this is equivalent to x square plus 1 being a factor or dividing p of x minus q of x. 
So this is the the, equal, the equivalence relation of the cosets involved. And what are the operations, addition and multiplication operations here? P of x plus x square plus 1 plus, so we define addition in C, R of x mod x square plus 1. So the two such elements, two such cosets are added. The definition is basically P of x plus Q of x, the coset represented by this polynomial. So this is the sum of two such cosets. And what about P of x plus x square plus 1 times Q of x plus x square plus 1? This will be equal to, defined to be equal to P of x times Q of x plus x square plus 1. These are the standard definition of the addition and multiplication operation which is being defined on the quotient spaces. And again, let me invoke more, uh, let me invoke the uh, knowledge from ring theory to say that C is a commutative ring. with identity with these operations. So we have found a commutative ring which is a candidate. So why is this a candidate? Okay, so let's clear that first. Uh, define the following map. Define let's say phi from R to C given by phi of a for any real number a define this to be equal to a the coset represented by basically a plus x square plus 1. So it is a very easy check to see that this is a ring homomorphism and also notice that phi is injective phi embeds r into c. So claim phi embeds phi is injective. To check it is injective, what do we have to do? So if, so proof, uh, proof of the claim. If P of A is equal to P of B, what does that mean? Then A plus the ideal generated by X square plus 1 is the same as B plus the ideal generated by X square plus 1. But that would mean that A minus B or rather x square plus 1 divides a minus b but a minus b is a real number how can x square plus 1 divide a minus b any divisible any factor uh, any mul multiple of x square plus 1 should have at least degree 2 or else it should be the zero polynomial so a minus b having degree 0 since degree of a minus b is equal to 0, we have a minus b is equal to x square plus 1 times 0, which is equal to 0. Whereas the degrees won't uh, match, which implies a is equal to b. So, so immediately we see that the map phi from R to C is an embedding, is an emb it, it actually gives us a copy of R in the commutative ring C. So that is one aspect of the definition solved and my claim is now that we can get hold of a root of x square plus 1 in this particular uh, commutative ring. So let i be defined to be, so yeah this is establishing the claim, so let i be defined to be equal to the coset represented by x square plus 1 in C. Recall that C is R of x mod x square plus 1. So, you look at the coset represented by x. Then, what is i square plus 1 in C? i square plus 1 will just be x plus x square plus 1 square 
plus 1 plus x square plus 1. This is what it means to look at i square plus 1 in C, right? This is equal to this. And by the definitions of multiplication and addition that we have defined in the quotient, this is going to be x square plus 1 plus the ideal generated by the coset represented by x square plus 1. But the coset of the ideal generated by x square plus 1, which is represented by x square plus 1, will be the zero ideal itself, right? So, this is just the zero element of x square plus 1 because x square plus 1 belongs to our given ideal. And this implies that i square plus 1 is equal to the zero in C. So, hence we have both a solution to x square plus 1 is equal to 0 and a copy of R sitting inside. And a copy of where was the map phi? Let us see. A copy of phi sitting inside C. A, a copy of R sitting inside C. So, we have addressed two of the aspects in the definition of a complex number, a field of complex number. In fact, we also can say about uh, say something more about the uh, characterization, namely that this is actually generated by R and I. How can we say that? Any element, you look at any element in C. So, I am writing C. Remember that C is R of x mod x square plus 1. This is represented by P of x plus the ideal generator, some coset of x square plus 1, right, by some particular, some polynomial P of x. But then this also, e, this is equal to, this is equal to P of the coset representative of x, right, the polynomial expression of the coset representative of x. This is equal to P of i. That means i e any element, coset representative of x is what we call as i, right? Any element of C can be written as a polynomial expression in of i with coefficients in R. But what can we say about any field of C which contains R and I? It will certainly have any polynomial expression in I coefficients in R because it is a field because it is closed under pro both product and uh, multiplication and addition. So, this tells us that hence any subring of C which contains R and I should necessarily be equal to C. B, C. So, we have let us just go back to the definition of a field of complex numbers. This is our definition, right? Let me use uh, green color to underline those aspects which we have already established. So, this is a field of, uh, it is a field which contains R, it is a field which contains R. This is something which we just established as a subfield, it contains R, okay, as a subfield, as of now it is just a subring, but we will come to that. And I is a root for the polynomial x square plus 1 that is also something which we have established. This is also something which we have just established. The only thing that is to be checked, okay, maybe I should, huh. the only thing that is to be checked is whether it is a field. As of now, whatever we have constructed, see, it is just a commutative ring with identity. So, if we establish that it is indeed a field as well, we would have proved the existence of uh, such a field of complex numbers. So, let us now work towards proving that this particular commutative ring is indeed a field. So, in order to do that, 
let's focus on the polynomial x square plus 1 in r of x the polynomial x square plus 1 is irreducible is an irreducible element in the commutative tiering r of x so the first observation would be that an irreducible element in r of x would be prime in more specifically x square plus 1 is hence a prime element recall what a prime element was in a ring a p was p is defined to be a prime element if whenever p divide, divides a b the product of two elements a and b in the ring p either divides a or p divides b that is the definition of a prime element so the claim here is that x square plus 1 is a prime element in r of x let's just check that very quickly let x square plus 1 divide p of x times q of x let's prove that it divides one of the two so without loss of generality if x square plus 1 divides p of x then we are already through if x square plus 1 does not divide p of x x square plus 1 is an irreducible polynomial and therefore x square plus 1 is an irreducible polynomial and therefore if you look at the greatest common divisor of x square plus 1 and p of x it should necessarily be 1 right so it will be a unit so it will be 1 here so let me then since let me phrase it this way since x square plus 1 is irreducible there exist polynomials alpha of x and beta of x such that alpha of x times x square plus 1 plus beta of x times p of x is equal to the constant polynomial 1. Now let us divide, multiply, multiplying q of x to the equation above. We have alpha of x times x square plus 1 times q of x plus beta of x times p of x times q of x this is equal to q of x. But if you focus on the left hand side, this term is divisible by q of x because there is only a q of x in this particular term sorry is divisible by x square plus 1 because x square plus 1 is anyway in the term itself, it is one of the factors and here x square plus 1 divides the product p of x times q of x that is how we began the argument and therefore the left hand side is divisible by x square plus 1 since LHS is divisible by x square plus 1 we have x square plus 1 divides q of x and therefore x square plus 1 is a prime element and therefore the ideal generated by x square plus 1 is going to be a prime idea and therefore we were we defined c to be the quotient of x square plus 1 by this particular prime ideal and we know that when we go modulo of prime ideal we get an integral domain since x square plus 1 is a prime ideal we have c is an integral domain in fact r of x being a euclidean domain would have immediately told us that this is a maximal ideal but let, let me not do that uh, let me not give that argument i would like to take a slightly more circuitous route to prove that c is indeed a field so we just have established right now that it is a prime ideal and hence this is an integral domain the fact that uh, C is a field is now established only after showing that every non-zero element can be inverted. Okay, so let us set out to prove that. But before we get into that, notice that R of X is containing R as a subfield, right? Uh, the, uh, containing R inside, there is a copy of R sitting inside. So, notice that R of X 
because r is the uh, there is a copy of r in r of x this is a vector space over r with uh, generating set given by 1 x x square and so on and since c is a quotient of r of x by an ideal c is also a vector space over r well we just checked that there is an embedding of r into c it's a vector space over r but the quotienting tells us where to look for a generating set with a generating set given by 1 i i square and so on but we know what happens to i in in c we know that i square is minus 1 and since i square is minus 1 we have a, we have 1 comma i is a spanning set of c so we have a set consisting of two elements which is a spanning set of c also notice that i does not belong to r why is that the case because if i belongs to r what was i i was the coset representative sorry i was the coset represented by the polynomial x and if it is in r that would mean that x plus the ideal generated by x square plus 1 is some a plus x square plus 1 where a is a real number or that would mean that x minus a is in the ideal generated by x square plus 1 which cannot be the case because x minus a will have degree 1 right so i does not belong to r and therefore 1 and i turn out to be linearly independent so hence 1 comma i is a basis of c over r so we have just established as a lemma let me write it down c is a two dimensional vector space over r we have still not proved that c is a field so in order to do that let's take an arbitrary element z in c so define mz the map from c to itself given by mz of w is defined to be z times w we have already checked that c is an integral domain this is multi left multiplication by z and you should check that mz is actually an r linear map it's a linear transformation this is a linear transformation this is an easy check and you will immediately note that the null space of mz what will be in the null space it will be all those vector all those elements w such that z times w is equal to the zero element but z times w equal to zero is uh, in other words telling us that okay so let me do one thing let me start with z which is not the zero element so if z times w is equal to zero that would mean that z is a zero divisor if z is a non zero element right and c we already checked is an integral domain therefore this cannot happen so this is the only the only element in the null space of mz is necessarily the zero element no other element can be in the null space and therefore mz is an injective linear transformation from a two dimensional vector space to itself what can we say about an injective linear transformation from a finite dimensional vector space to itself it should necessarily be surjective by the rationality theorem so since mz is injective or is an injective linear transformation So linear operator from a finite dimensional vector space to 
itself by the rank nullity theorem or the dimension theorem if you prefer it that way mz is subjective that means there exists some w prime such that z times w prime is the coset represented by 1. Hence, there exists w prime in C such that mz of w prime is equal to the unit element in C. And that means z times w prime is equal to 1 and hence z is equitable. Therefore, C is a field. So, we have established every aspect of C being a field of complex numbers. Okay, so we now have one such field of complex numbers. We have answered one of the questions that arose from the definitions satisfactorily. Let us now move over to the second one that is more easier than this the question of uniqueness. Let me in fact write down a theorem directly to capture that. Write down it, let me write it down in the next page. Theorem. So, theorem. So, let C prime be a field of complex numbers with i prime a root of x square plus 1. Then C prime is isomorphic field isomorphism to C. So, any root of uh, getting hold of a field of complex numbers you uh, choose to take does not matter. You will eventually end up with an object, uh, an algebraic object which is isomorphic to the field of complex numbers which we have just constructed. But that is quite straightforward. Let us just quickly look at the proof. So, let us define <coughs> a map psi from C to C prime given by any expression, any element in C, we can think of the uh, element as being a polynomial expression in I, right. So, let us look at one such element. Let us take P of I and define it to be P of I prime. So, notice that this particular map sends R to the copy of R, its identity on R and it sends i to i prime that is the map and it will be a field uh, homomorphism from c to c prime. So, in particular check that psi is a homomorphism and because it is identity on R it will be an embedding of c into c prime psi of c is a field is a subfield of C prime, but this psi of C has certain characteristics which contains R because it is identity on R, it will send R to R, right. It also contains I prime because psi of I is I prime by the very definition of psi. And what can we say about uh, the subfield because C is a since C prime is a field of complex numbers. This forces psi of C to be the entire C prime, and hence psi is a field isomorphism. So, 
we have established a remarkable aspect here it tells us that with the definition of complex numbers that we gave here the the methodology with which we get hold of such a field of complex numbers that really doesn't matter however we get hold of such a field of complex numbers which satisfies these properties they should necessarily be isomorphic to each other that is what we have just established and therefore we could study analysis over any one such field that we uh, can construct in the next lecture we will get hold of another such uh, construction of a field of complex numbers and that will be more handy to work with and we will be doing analysis on that field of complex numbers from now on so as i had mentioned this is one lecture which is very algebraic in its flavor the rest of the lectures uh, will slowly turn into being far more analytic all right let me stop here